The recording has started. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is Reverend Rosemary with you this evening. Thanking God again for bringing us together so that we can partake of the wonderful word that he has prepared for us. We are going to open with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your great love for us. We thank you for your continued mercy and grace that has brought us into this time, oh God. Thank you for keeping us, for undertaking for us, for providing for us in the name of Jesus. And as we join tonight in the one I call, Father, we pray that your spirit will minister to us in a mighty way, oh Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you will meet us at our point of need. It will open the eyes of our understanding and cause us to see wondrous things in your word. And Father, we thank you for writing that word on the tables of our heart, that indeed we may be changed, we may be transformed by your word, that we may be blessed as we become doers of the word. We thank you for what you have begun in our lives and what you are yet to do so that your name can be glorified in us and through us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight I have a uh, message that I believe it's in, well, very timely. And um, some might think it's a bit uh, firm, but sometimes we need to be just that uh, for with ourselves and also as we minister to others because this is what the Spirit of God is calling for. So the name of my message is entitled, Be Mature. Amen. You know, there are many believers who are sincere at um, waking up to the fact that the spirit of God and the world, the spirit of the world, are completely at odds with each other. And yet there are other believers who just have not really received that revelation as they should. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says, and I'm reading that passage, is for what man knoweth the things of men save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He so there are things that only we will know. And these are spiritual things by the Spirit of God. We have, for example, in the book of Hebrews, believers who, because of the pressure that they were under, they were undergoing such persecution that they were drawing back to what the Bible calls to perdition. And Paul had to, the Apostle Paul had to address that issue. And I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the counsel that he gave them because there are so many principles involved there. And primarily, this one principle that if we are not moving forward, we are actually regressing. Some people might think that we're just standing still, but you see, this can happen. We are in a world where everything is moving. It's either we move forward, we swim against the current, because this is what Christianity is. The spirit of the world is very opposite to the spirit of God. And so we have to swim against the current. And if we stop putting that effort in to move forward with God, then we find ourselves drawing back. And 
Paul, the Apostle Paul, wants to teach the Hebrew Christians about the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. But regrettably, he felt that he could not go on to these high teachings, saying that they needed again to be taught what he says are the basic, the fundamental principles of Christianity. And so Paul says that these believers were, uh, number one, dull of hearing, and secondly, he called them babes who are in need of milk. And then he said that they should have been mature at this point, seeing that how much teaching they had received. And he says, you should have been not only mature, but be also teachers. And let me go ahead and read that passage from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. So we see in that passage there that Paul uh, had to digress because the people you know, had not grown spiritually. They were not ready to receive the meat of the word. Uh, and just like in the church of Corinth, there was carnality, schisms, and division. Uh, you know, these things were present in the church. And um, there were contentions among the brethren. Uh, for example, some of them were saying, oh, we are of Paul. The others, others were saying we are of Apollos or Cephas. Others were saying we are of Christ. And then uh, Paul had to ask in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13, he says, is Christ divided? You see, the church of Corinth had more gifts of the Spirit than the other churches, but they had fewer fruits of the Spirit. Amen. And um, you see, they were acting as babes. And whatever the reason was, it was not justified. And so because of that, the, the believers in that church, the Hebrew believers, had become what Paul described as dull of hearing. And they did not want to hear the truth, which denotes an attitude of the heart. You see, the right attitude is vital for Christian growth and development. Um, we should not be fooled because, again, where there is no growth, uh, one faith does not remain just stagnant. It decreases, and the believer draws back into perdition, as stated in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. So we should always maintain a humble attitude and have a teachable spirit. You see, um, another scripture reference tells a uh, actually explains this, the purpose of the word of God very well. And uh, that passage is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the men of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. So we see that scripture is given by God as a rule of faith for edification. And this is fundamental and primary to Christian faith. Without this, our house, that is our life, is weak and there is no strength. You see, if a believer is off in the basics, how close to the truth will he be when he gets to the high things? 
so as we look uh, a little bit more closely at the passage in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verses 12 to 14, I'm going to uh, quickly examine what Paul was teaching concerning those who need milk and those com- as compared to those who have graduated to what he calls strong meat. So we see that those who have are able to handle the strong meat of the word, they are number one teachers, and in other words, and they are full age, they have become mature. Uh, number two, they use or exercise their senses, in other words, spiritual senses, for example, discernment, wisdom, knowledge, the knowledge of the things of God, understanding, and um, they are spiritually sharp. They also have knowledge, as I said, and then they also can make an impact in, in this world. They can teach, they can give what they have, because you cannot give, no one can give what he doesn't have. So they are able to teach others and minister to others. Whereas those who are in need of milk, they are unskillful in the word of righteousness. They are dull or lethargic. There is very little activity around the things of God. Their spiritual senses are not developed. There is no discernment. There is no understanding. And because of that, they also don't have much to share to give to because of that they can be taken advantage of through ignorance and so the word of god admonishes us to be mature in matters of spiritual understanding and that should be reflected in our way of thinking and acting meaning our behavior our attitude our manner of life actually in first corinthians I believe it's chapter 14 and verse 20. We, uh, it is said that in understanding, we must be men. In other words, be mature. Praise God. So this is what the Apostle Paul is instructing these people, these Hebrew Christians who are um, on the verge. Some of them are on the verge of giving up um, because of the pressure that they were experiencing. And um, the one one good thing that we have to see is uh, Paul was full of the love of God. Amen. And this correction that he was bringing to them through teaching um, shows that not only he loved them, but um, he knew how to to handle the, the correction in a very wise way. He was loving, but he was firm. Amen. And so uh, there is a particular, I'm going to read that passage, um, some words that he he addressed to this church with sometimes, you know, as we read, this is very harsh, but um, again, that I believe was what the Spirit of God was calling for. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, Verses 4 through 9, this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it and brings forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Verse 9, he says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, 
and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Amen. What Paul is essentially saying here is, is telling them to get your act together, or you might cross the line and fall off the deep end. Then no one will be able to help you and you destroy yourself. Because he says if it's impossible if they fall away to renew them to repentance. So Paul immediately saying, you know, by saying this in verses seven and eight, he adds, the earth which drinks the rain and bears thorn is rejected and burned. So that seems very severe. However, he he also combines this with the love of God, amen, uh, uh, so that they can feel that he's not just being reprimanding them and being harsh. Um, he says in verse 9, immediately he says, uh, he lets them know that he believes better things about them and for them. In other words, he's talking about growth. He's talking about blessings. Amen. He says, I believe you are persuaded better things of you than things that accompany salvation. Hallelujah. So again, he, the admonition was here was don't let your salvation slip away from you. Don't lose out on your, on your blessings. Grow up. Amen. Yes, there will be pressures. There will be, you know, uh, you know, persecution, uh, all of us. The Bible says in this life, we shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, Jesus says, for I have overcome, hallelujah. So you see spiritual reality results from a proper relationship to God through his word. And God's word is truth. Uh, The Bible tells us that in John 17 and verse 17. And if we are rightly related uh, to the truth of God, then we cannot be dishonest. We cannot be, um, if I can use the word, hypocritical. And, um, you know, James in, 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 uh, in his epistle speaks of uh, three particular responsibilities that we all have towards the word of God. And James was, a, you know, was the, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. And he was a, a no-nonsense person. As, you know, we spent time reading his epistle to find that this man really, he, you know, you couldn't play around with spiritual things around him. And so in verses 17, uh, and to 23 in James chapter 1, we see that um, he speaks of these three responsibilities that we all have uh, towards the word. Number one, he says that we must receive the word. Number two, that we must practice the word. Uh, number three, that we must share the word. Amen. And if we fulfill these responsibilities, we will grow spiritually and have an honest walk with God and with men. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead and look at um, these responsibilities, uh, starting with receiving the word. Amen. So uh, I'm going to read verses uh, 19 to 21. That's James 1, verses 19 to 21. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, be, sorry, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Amen. So what uh, notice here that James 
calls the word of God the engrafted word. Amen. We must allow the word to become engrafted in us. We must become one with the word of God. And that happens as we spend time in the word, as we spend time with God in prayer and allow the spirit of God to download the word in our spirit. And when that happens, then we have revelation about what that particular word is speaking and how that is connected to our life. You know, and, and, you know, there is a marriage, a union that happens. That's why Jesus is able to say in John 15 and, and verse 7 that, you know, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, that's the abiding that we're talking about here, the oneness. He says, then when that happens, you can ask for anything, then it will be given to you. Um, because at that point, when we are abiding in the word and the word abides in us, then it is no longer, you know, us, you know, the, the, the fleshly person who is speaking. It is the Lord speaking through us. And he uses us as a channel to ask, you know, what is needful so that he can bring us into that place that he had already ordained for us or to bring an answer and a solution to whatever particular issue that we have placed before him. Amen. And so uh, this is what he's speaking about when he says the word must be engrafted in us. And um, borrowing from the parable of the sower, which we can find in, um, well, actually many, several of the gospel, but for example, Matthew chapter 13, um, verses 1 through 9, and then it picks up again, verses 18 to 23, um, where Jesus is comparing the word of God to a seed. And he compares also the human heart to soil. And uh, in this parable, Jesus describes four types of heart. And uh, he speaks about the, the, the hard, what he calls the hard heart which did not understand or receive the word and therefore did not bear any fruit. And then secondly, there is, uh, he spoke of the shallow heart. Uh, that was a type of heart that was very emotional, but had no depth, was quick to receive the word, you know, very happy with joy. But then uh, whenever persecution arose, then, you know, there was a change of heart. And again, no, no fruit no fruit to bearing. Um, a third type of heart is what we could call, for example, a crowded heart, um, a heart which lacked repentance and permitted, uh, you know, sin to crowd out the word, the, the things of the world got into it. And uh, again, there was no fruit. And then finally, there is the fruitful heart which received the word of God, which allowed it to take root and produce a bountiful harvest of fruit. Amen. And you see, the final test of our salvation is fruit. Amen. Jesus says that he, we did not choose him, but he chose us. Amen. That we could go forth and that we could bear much fruit and that our fruit will remain. Hallelujah. Bearing fruit speaks about a changed life. It speaks about Christian character and conduct, and as well as ministry to others, uh, being done for the glory, in the glory and for the glory of God. Hallelujah. And this fruit might be, for example, winning souls to Christ or, you know, growing in holy living, uh, sharing material possessions, uh, grow, you know, uh, increasing in spiritual character or whatever good works that the Lord lays on our heart, even, you know, praising the Lord, being a worshiper. And, um, you know, there are um, instructions that uh, based on Galatians uh, chapter five, if we look at 
uh, this portion of scripture that speaks about the fruit of the spirit uh, that we are given here. For example, uh, Galatians 5 verses 22 to 25. Uh, I'll go ahead and read that passage. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Amen. Praise God. So in essence, we see that Religious works uh, may be manufactured, um, but they do not, you know, they do not have the life of God in them. And they do not bring glory to God. If they are not, if, if, if work is not done by the glory of God, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, then they are just mere works done by the flesh. Though they may be good on the outside, but everything that we do must be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Real fruit has in it the seed for more fruit so that the harvest continues to grow more fruit, much fruit, as we mentioned again in John chapter 15. But you see, the word of God cannot work in our lives unless we receive it in the right way. And that we must take heed what we hear. He says that in Mark chapter 4, in verse 24, but he also says to take heed how we hear. And the reference for that is Luke chapter 8 and verse 18. And you see, there are too many people. And when I say people, I'm speaking about believers, Christians, um, who are in that tragic condition in which um, they are hearing and um, but it's not a real hearing, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 13. He says, "Hearing they hear not, neither do they understand." You see, too many Christians are in that place where they attend classes and church services, but they never seem to grow. And um, is it possible? that they may be, as the Apostle Paul uh, described in that case for the Hebrew believers, uh, that they are dull of hearing uh, because of allowing too much corruption of the world uh, to get into their lives, too much decay to settle into their heart and life. You see, if the seed of the word is to be planted in our hearts, then we have to follow, we have to obey the instruction that the word gives us. So one thing he says is that we have to be swift to hear. Amen. Uh, again, going back to James chapter 1, verse 19, he says, I will read that verse again. He says, wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to to wrath. Amen. So if we are to be swift to hear, then as Jesus says, let him who has ears, let him hear. Amen. We have a disposition that we want to hear the word. Uh, and hearing the word means that we will acquire the faith that is needed. Hallelujah. To walk in faith. Faith towards God. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you see, just as um, 
a servant, let's say, is quick to hear his master's voice, and a mother to hear uh, a baby's even smallest cry. Uh, so the believer should be quick to hear what God has to say. Um, you see, there is a beautiful illustration of this truth in the life of King David. Um, David was hiding from the Philistines who were in possession of Bethlehem. And he yearned for a drink of the cool water from a well in Bethlehem, a well that he had often visited when he was a, a youth. And uh, we find that account in Second Samuel chapter 23, verses 14 through 17. And uh, David did not issue an order to his men to go and get him that water, but he only merely uh, said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. As if speaking to himself, oh, how he wishes that he could just have that water. Uh, and that's stated in Second Samuel 23 and verse 15. And, you know, three of his men um, heard the king sigh for water, and they risked their lives to secure the water and to bring it to him. And this is what we can say, that the person is really swift to hear. Amen. But secondly, we are also told in James 1, verse 19, that we must be slow to speak. Uh, I've heard it said uh, that uh, we all have two ears and just one mouth. And, um, and this should be a reminder to us that we are to listen more than we are to speak. You know, too many times we, we argue with God's word. Uh, and by argument, I'm not talking even audibly, uh, you know, but at least in our hearts and minds, we always we try to reason things out with God. And um, Proverbs 10 and verse 19 tells us that the one who refrains his lips is wise. Amen. And um, another uh, verse there in Proverbs, uh, I could quote is uh, Proverbs 17 and verse 27, which says that, um, it says, he that has knowledge spares his words. Um, so, you know, instead of being, uh, you know, quick to speak, uh, you know, the Bible wants us to take time to evaluate everything, uh, weight uh, based on what the Spirit of God is, is saying before we speak. And there is um, an illustration in the book of Luke, for example, uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 29, uh, where there was a, a, a young lawyer who was arguing actually with Jesus. Uh, and he said, um, and who is my neighbor? You know, um, well, you know, in the early church, what happened is that the services were informal and often the listeners, listeners would debate with the speaker. And sometimes there were even fightings and wars among the brethren. And so, um, we need to just not be quick to just, you know, allow ourselves to just question. Let's take time to be, first of all, quick to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Weigh things before we speak them out. Amen. And the third instruction that we receive here is in James 1.19 is to be slow to wrath. Um, you see, there are, there are believers who get angry at God, who get angry at the word. And um, Proverbs 14 says, uh, verse 29, 14, 29 says that he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of the spirit exalts folly. You see, when um, the prophet, as an illustration, the prophet Nathan 
told King David the story about uh, the stolen ewe lamb, uh, the king became angry, uh, but he got angry at the wrong person. Uh, right away, he was saying, where is that person? Who is this? this? You know, send him, you know, here, you know, he's going to be punished and, you know, usually, you know, could even be killed. And um, the prophet Nathan told David, you are the man. And then when David realized that Nathan had been speaking about him, David confessed and he said, uh, I have sinned. Uh, and that's in Second Samuel chapter 12. We find that account. Amen. So we find that, um, you know, here was King David because he did not allow himself time to really understand what the prophet was saying, though he was the man guilty, but yet he was quick to pronounce judgment and punishment on another, not realizing that it was himself who was at cause. And we have another example uh, where in the, in the garden, when they came to uh, arrest Jesus, Peter, was showed that he was slow to hear, swift to speak, and swift to anger. And he took out his sword and cut a soldier's ears and almost killed the man with the sword. Um, so we see that, you know, many fights um, in the church among believers are the results of short tempers and hasty words. And, you know, there is a place for godly anger. The Bible says to us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, that, you know, be angry, but sin not. Amen. And if we have the love of the world in us, then, um, then sin will be present. Uh, by, by love of the world, in other words, doing things the world's way rather than the way you know, what the Bible instructs us to do and have equipped us to do because we have the spirit of God in us. We have the word of God that he's given us. Um, and so as we purpose to walk in the word, the Holy Spirit will be present to help us through. Amen. But just man's anger does not produce God's righteousness, the Bible tells us. Right here in James chapter 1 and verse 20. And in fact, Anger is just the opposite of the patience that God wants to produce in our lives as we mature in Christ. So wherever we might be, uh, let's, you know, understand that there is always room for growth. Amen. God is calling all of us to maturity. And we can never stop growing in Christ. We can never attain to that place. You know, if the Apostle Paul says, I have not attained, I mean, just, you know, just think of us, if he could make such a statement. So we are here to learn, to grow spiritually, and to become mature. And the person who cannot get angry at sin really does not have much strength to fight sin. And so um, we, find that, we find that what the James is doing in uh, the verses that I've just read, actually the whole book of James, he's warning us against uh, immaturity. Amen. And in this particular case, he's warning us against getting angry at God's words because it reveals to us our sin. And this is exactly what the word of God is designed to do. Second, um, Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 tells us that when we go to the word as we you know behold the word with sincere heart with open face and we, we contemplate we, we are exposed to the glory of the Lord as we look into the mirror of the word and the word reflects to us not only you know what, where God wants to take us, but first it reveals to us our condition, our heart condition. 
And because this is how any change can happen, you first see where you are at and where God, and then where God wants to take you. And then you have to use your own will, exercise your own will to say, and yes, Lord, I'm willing to be changed so that I can bear, bear the, your image. And so when, when we look at in the mirror of the word, word, the Bible says, and we come with open face, we behold the glory changed from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, you know, uh, you know, there's a story about a man who uh, look, who broke a mirror because he disliked the image in it. And uh, so there are Christians who rebel against God's word because it tells the truth about, you know, their condition. Um, and the, the solution to that is, you know, is that we have to be ready to always have a heart that is prepared to make God a dwelling place. Amen. Because indeed, this is what we are. The Bible says that the moment we give our life to Christ, we become the temple of God, a place where God dwells. The spirit of God dwells in us. Amen. And, uh, you know, James saw the human heart as a garden. And, you know, if left to itself, the soil would produce only weeds. And so as I read back again uh, this passage in James chapter 1 and verse 21, he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, um, so what James is saying here is he's urging the believer to pull out the weeds and to prepare the soil for the implanted word of God. And the phrase superfluity of naughtiness gives the picture of a garden overgrown with weeds that cannot be controlled. And, um, and truly, it's foolish to try to receive God's word into a heart that is not prepared. So... Um, here is an important factor or, or even a principle that we must pay attention to. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us that we must receive a love of the truth. You know, from that passage, we see that, you know, unrighteous deception will ensnare those, you know, who do not have such a love. Um, because notice, um, let me go ahead and read that passage. It says that um, unrighteous deception will ensnare those who are per perishing because they did not uh, welcome the love of the truth so as to be saved. Amen. Uh, let me read it from the King James. And it says, and with all deceivableness, of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Amen. So really God offers us a love of the truth and we must accept it to be saved and to grow spiritually, uh, which all culminates into our transformation into Christ likeness. Because this is pretty much the ultimate objective of uh, our salvation. Uh, and this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in today's church. Uh, Romans 8.29 tells us that the Holy Spirit is working in us to conform us into the image of Christ. And uh, cultivating a love of the truth entails more than just reading our Bible and going to church and you know, just hearing sermons. 
it means having a passionate commitment to the truth of God. And therefore, there must be a deliberate pursuit of the truth. We live in a world that we are bombarded with misinformation, uh, all sorts of you know, erroneous teachings all over the place. And so we must purpose in our heart in order to truly prepare, prepare our heart to receive the word of God. We must first have that heart attitude that we love the word, that we want the word. We have to pursue the word, amen. And uh, we find out actually in that same passage of scripture in Second Thessalonians, the next verse was 11 and 12, um, we, we, we find out what happens to those who reject the love of the truth. Notice, it's not just having the truth, it's having a love of the truth. Um, verses, Second Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Amen. You know, these letters are written to Christians. And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes when I think, well, this is really strong language. Uh, and sometimes I think we do need to be reminded that this is very serious. Amen. If we don't keep pushing forward, the world will sell us their lies, and before we know it, we'll buy into them because we don't have, if we don't have a love for the truth, and people are misled and deluded when they are governed by their soul rather than their spirit, and we find that too many Christians are moved by how they feel. You see, the Bible says that a Christian lives by faith and not by sight. Amen. And so, how do we prepare the soil of our heart for God's word? We have to first be willing to humble ourselves and, you know, confess our sin and ask for forgiveness. The Bible says that if we confess our sin in First John uh, chapter 1 and verse 9, that God is faithful, that he is not only going to forgive us of our sins, but he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen. And the second thing that we must do is to meditate on God's word, on, on his love, on his grace, and, and ask him to plow up any hardness in our heart. Um, you know, Jer Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 3 speaks about breaking up fallow ground um, and so, sowing not among thorns. Amen. And um, so we have to have that willingness for God to search us, for God to expose those dark areas in our lives so that we can let the light of God come in and change us. And we must also, as I said, approach all of this with an attitude of meekness. So that's why James is saying, we receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your soul. Amen. And uh, when we receive the word with meekness, we don't argue with it but we honor it as the word of God. And, and also we don't try to twist it to conform to our thinking. You know, um, my, my niece recently uh, told me about an experience of speaking to a Christian who was arguing her point, uh, which actually was totally unbiblical. And um, my niece was trying to ask, her, well, where did you get this? And young lady uh, finally uh, you know, admitted that, well, she hadn't seen it in the Bible, but she saw a movie, um, and that's what the movie said. And therefore, she took it at gospel, you know, that this was the word of God, gospel truth. So this shows you how much time some people spend in studying the word, in coming to the word of God, to want to know what is the mind of God, and they buy the, into the lies of the enemy. And uh, you see, the times that we are living in are very challenging times, uh, to say the least. And one of the signs that 
we are indeed living in the last days is the fulfillment of Jesus' teaching that we find in um, the Olivet Discourse, which is in Matthew chapter 24. And in, this, in verse 12 of Matthew 24, Jesus says this, He says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And this is noticeable everywhere. Um, You know, iniquity is abounding and love seems growing, um, you know, seems to be no longer uh, a part of the language of many, even in the church. And if we want to go spiritually and bear fruit, that is pleasing to God, is going to take a real commitment to walk in truth and to walk in God's love, regardless of what happens, whether we are um, being bombarded from the outside, um, of, you know, for example, how we are treated or how offended we feel. We have to purpose to walk in God's love, because love is the mark of maturity. Amen. And, you know, spiritual warfare is, in general, very subtle. Um, You know, we may be bearing fruits, for example, fruits of righteousness and holiness. Um, In other words, we may have repented of sins of the flesh and not living any longer in sin and practicing um, you know, we are practicing good godliness. Uh, we are staying away from things uh, such as, let's say, lying or stealing, gossiping, fornication, adultery, envy, jealousy. I mean, the whole list. Amen. Um, and we may even be involved in some kind of ministry. Um, but in general, there is a lack of understanding of the spirit uh, in which many people operate. And the question is, are we operating in true love, the true love of God? And the subject of faith has received a lot of attention in the church, much more so than love. And, um, you know, the love should be the spirit behind um, every act of obedience. But not much is being taught in many churches, or, you know, if I could say even the church in general. And, um, but you see, the Bible teaches us that faith works by love. So if indeed we believe this, which is the truth, then how come we don't find, you know, more love flowing in the church of Jesus Christ? You know, uh, the Pharisees once asked Jesus, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And um, that passage, um, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 and 40. And it says, Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. And um, you see, no commandment has any weight without the love of God. Because love rules over every commandment. It inspires every commandment and it moves every act of obedience. So, you see, all of the commandments, other than loving God, uh, may be limited in application. It may, be, it may apply, let's say, for example, to certain situations and not to others. Or it might, you know, not be for all the time. But the love of God, love, on the other hand, transcends all seasons. It transcends all geographical boundaries and locations and uh, it, it, it floods, it enters into every sphere of life. And uh, when we purpose to, to, to love God, then our heart is tender to obey him and follow what he says. 
actually, you know, I believe it's in John 14, he says, well, you know, why do you say you, you know, you call me master and say that you love me and you are not doing uh, what I've instructed you? Um, you see, Nicodemus had an encounter with Jesus. Uh, we all know that passage in John 3. And uh, he's, Jesus, you know, said to him something that's very important. Uh, I'm going to read those two verses. Jesus said to him, verse 3, um, Verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then again, we see in verse 5, Jesus says again unto him, Except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And you see, the point I'm making is this. If we are born again, we have the spirit of God indwelling us. We then have the mind of Christ. This is what the Bible tells us. And we are also told that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And so Jesus, in essence, was telling Nicodemus that there is power in the word of God and in the spirit to make this happen. When he says, unless a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, Nicodemus was wondering, how can anybody be born again? Can I enter into my mother's womb? Can I do this? But no, Jesus says, let's be born of water and the spirit. So Jesus made the point that there is power in the word of God. And the spirit is at present to make this happen. Uh, again, which takes us to this uh, passage of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, that says now the spirit, uh, the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Therefore, you know, we have as born again Christians dwelling in us all that we need for life and godliness. And there is a transformation that must accompany the new birth. And the practice of love is an important uh, factor. Um, you know, it's as important as you know, living a sinless life because actually it's impossible to live a sinless life without love. Uh, we must love our neighbors as ourselves. Otherwise, we are going to sin against them. And, um, you know, the Apostle Paul, John, sorry, the Apostle John, he actually joined um, uh, obedience to God's commandment and walking in love together. And he says, this is what he says. He says in 1 John 3 verses 14 and 15, he says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Amen. So he's saying that there is no difference between a person who hates his brother meaning the absence of love, and then a murderer, that is the act of the sin itself. Amen. So a person who does not uh, love abides in spiritual death. And we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So not to love is not just a weakness. It is really spiritual uh, bankruptcy. And whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And, and no murderer, again, has eternal life. And, you know, it is not optional for the believer to walk in love. To be born again and walking in love are really are intertwined. And... John made it categorically clear that no one can claim to be born of God, you know, um, if one 
does not love because God is love. Amen. And love is not just something that God does. We cannot separate God from love. God is love. And we must likewise seek to incorporate love into our life. Amen. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, finally, let me say this, that, you know, there is a brand new type of love that flows out of the spirit of the born again person. And the Bible tells us that the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And so God is love. And those who are born of him must walk in love. And there are too many Christians who know nothing about the love of God. And they are proud. They are arrogant. They are insecure, uh, bitter, frustrated, impatient. I mean, there are so many, you know, adjectives that, we, you know, we could use. Um, and a lot, you know, too many are busy either offending people or getting offended. And the characteristics of love are sadly absent from their lives. And what we just saw is that the absence of love implies the absence of God. You know, um, 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8 says this. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. For he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Hallelujah. So, in closing, you see that the, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So let's remember what we first started out with, James chapter 1 and verse 21, telling us to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Amen. If we do not receive this implanted word, then the only thing that is happening is that we are deceiving ourselves. And if we want to argue, if we want to make our points of view known, uh, anything that, is, that contradicts the word of God, we are fooling ourselves. Amen. Uh, you know, and there are some who actually feel that, you know, that they are just, quote unquote, you know, discussions of promoting spiritual growth, when in reality, they may only be cultivating weeds in their garden. So our objective must be about becoming more like Christ and walking in his life, in his love and his power and in his glory. Hallelujah. This must be our way of life. We are living in times when this has to become our focus. Uh, you know, 24 hours a day, we can't afford to be walking in the flesh. If we live in the spirit, we must walk in the spirit. Amen. This is not an option. Um, we will be challenged. Amen. But Again, Jesus says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome. And to adopt a lower standard or a different standard that is not of God, then, you know, we would, we would have missed it altogether. You see, this is not our calling. And you know that the word Christian was first used in, in the early church in Antioch. Uh, you can go to Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, and see that. And the reason why the Christians then stopped being called um, people of the way or the followers of the Nazarene is because of their manner of life, which exemplified Christ. And so we cannot live 
less than a life of truth and a life of love. And it is a lo lifelong vocation to which there is truly no retirement if we want to be part of the family of Christ. And as we obey God in love, then we will be positioned to be blessed by him. Hallelujah. And I do believe that this is God's message to us today. It is a timely message because, again, uh, of our everyday challenges, and especially in focus on being mature, amen, doing things God's way, hallelujah, which means walking in light, walking in truth, and walking in love. This is our calling. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us go ahead and let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for calling us out of darkness and transmitting us into the kingdom of your dear son, into your kingdom of light. Father, we thank you for your word that is indeed life to us and for your Holy Spirit dwelling in us leading us into all truth and empowering us to live a life that is victorious in you. Lord, we thank you that you require us to walk as overcomers, and our calling is to be transformed more and more into your image, to be mature sons of God. So, Lord, we pray for a heart that has a passionate commitment to the truth, and this will be displayed in how we receive your word, being careful to apply it to every area of our lives. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that we will be quick to hear, we will be slow to speak, and slow to wrath, O oh God, and that your love, the love of God, will be our standard. And we thank you, Lord, for your anointing to make us strong in the power of your might so that we will not look at the pressures of our times as though there were obstacles uh, that could restrict us. But rather, you train our hands for war and you teach us to stand and to fight, oh Lord. So we thank you. We thank you that we will do as you have called us, oh Lord, to stand for your righteous cause. And by your grace, Lord, we thank you that what the enemy has made for evil will be turned around for good, to the praise and to the glory of your holy name. We thank you, Lord, and we worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this evening, and we invite you to come back again um, next Wednesday at the same time. God bless you and good night. Thank you.